Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Hadar's Winter Lecture Series with Dina Weiss. We're so glad to learn with you again this evening and engage with the question of how to have difficult conversations. A few quick announcements before we get started. A recording of tonight's lecture will be made available to folks who registered for the talk. You should have access to the student resources binder and uh, you'll be at which Bachi also just put in the chat and you can find the source sheet and the, uh, and the recordings of the, of the lectures there. Uh, the source sheet will be screen shared and shared via the chat as you just saw. Uh, auto transcription is, is available to those who activate it at the bottom of their screen. Um, the public chat function will be turned off for the duration of the lecture in order to help us directly engage with the substance of tonight's conversation. You can take a couple minutes just to say hello to folks if you're if you're seeing. I see some folks saying just saying hi and welcome and where you're tuning in from. But once the lecture starts, we're going to turn the chat off. Um, that being said, we are going to have time at the end to ask questions. Uh, so if you have questions, please note them down and, ch and chat them directly to me, Morty Labaton. Um, you can see me. My name is going to stay the same throughout the chat. Um, so if you uh, chat the questions to me, we'll get to as many as we can at the end of the lecture. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dina. Dina? Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for spending your Mota'e President's Day with us, um, engaging in the not always so pleasant, but always important topic of having difficult conversations. Tonight's topic is actually going to be a little bit more difficult um, than last week's topic. I know you probably thought it doesn't get harder, um, but in fact, it does get harder. Um, I have some bad news for you. We are going to be discussing how to deliver bad news. Um, and the reason why the topic of how to deliver bad news is in some ways more difficult than last week's conversation, which was about comforting mourners, is that when you are stepping into a Shiva house, you know what's happening, and also the mourner knows what's happening. There's a kind of shared understanding of what the project is, who has been lost, who is mourning, who is comforting whom. The roles and the context are actually quite clear. Um, but often when we are in a situation where we have to deliver bad news, the person to whom we are delivering the bad news does not know. Right, why we are there. And there is a very large element of uncertainty and surprise um, that is present whenever we are the ones who are giving someone news, right? It is new information that they did not have before. And we're going to talk a little bit about the stickiness of that, right? The sense that there is no real shared script there is no real shared understanding, right? And even when you're in a shiva house, often there are other visitors there, right? There's sort of, um, there's a diffusion often of the tension because there's the presence of a lot of people. But usually when we're having really tough conversations where we're telling someone something that might be hard for them to hear, usually we're doing that one-on-one. -on -one. Um, so that's one way in which tonight's conversation is gonna be a little bit more tricky. Um, than even last week's conversation. Um, and the other way um, is that I, I don't feel like we have quite the same amount of voluminous halachic guidance that we had um, when we were talking about nichum avelim, because comforting mourners, as we saw, is a mitzvah. Whenever something is a mitzvah, then the rabbis have a lot to say. Okay, but when something is just a human reality, Okay, and it's not clear that it's a mitzvah and it's not clear on whom it devolves, then we have to start looking a little bit farther afield. Um, and so all of the texts that we are going to be looking at tonight are going to be stories. We're going to be looking at a number of stories. We're going to be focusing on one main story, um, which is the Yalkut Shimoni's rendition of how it was that Moshe told Aharon that Aharon was about to die. Um, but we're going to see actually a set of stories where we're going to notice that there is a type of rabbinic convention, almost to the point of a trope, um, for how to deliver bad news. And we're not going to look at this trope 
um, in order to sort of learn directly from it, right? If this is the way that Rabbi Akiva told Rabbi Eliezer X, we are going to do the same. Um, but also, we're not going to use that as a negative example, right? Look at the rabbis. They weren't as sensitive as we are. Um, we know how to do things differently. Really, the goal of looking at these texts is both to uncover the rabbinic convention and learn from that convention, but also to sensitize us to our own conventions, right? The kind of scripts, the implicit scripts that we're all following, the certain understandings that we have about the right way to do this extremely um, difficult but holy work, um, and maybe destabilize some of those assumptions. Um, to give you an example of what I mean by conventions and assumptions, um, I would say, like number one on that list for me are certain euphemisms. Like, for example, if I want to admonish someone and tell them that they did something wrong, okay, we used to call that yelling at someone, and now we call that feedback. If we're being really explicit, we might call it constructive or even negative feedback. Okay, but feedback is a euphemism um, for what you're actually doing, which is telling someone they did something wrong. We used to call that rebuke, we used to call that tochacha, now we call that negative feedback. Um, so there's a lot of euphemisms, right, that are floating around that we use so unreflexively and so unselfconsciously, and I want us to kind of raise that up. Um, another one of our conventions, <coughs> this is very popular in the constructive feedback world, is compliment sandwich, right, which has a number of different manifestations. But if I have something difficult or unpleasant to say to you, I don't come right out and say it. That would be crass. That would be insensitive. So first I say something nice, then I say something difficult, and then I say something nice again, right? And that desire to sort of parenthesize the difficult thing that we are going to say, that is a social convention, right, that we have developed actually fairly recently. I um, mean, that's also, right, not necessarily the best way to always um, deliver bad news. And I would say, you know, um, and those are two examples that I could think of that are kind of universal, almost universal, certainly in American culture. Um, but I, you know, when I was thinking about this question of conventions, I realized that also like a lot of different relationships and a lot of different families, different configurations of people have their own set of conventions. Um, and I was reminded of actually a story of sharing happy news, but that really uh, concretized for me the fact that, at least in my family, there are so many strong conventions um, that I am not, not even you know, sensitized to them. Um, so when uh, my husband, now husband and I got engaged, I was in Israel and my parents were in America, so I had to call them to tell them the news. Already, you're not the best way to share good news, but if you're sharing good news, it doesn't really matter how you're doing it. And my family is an email family. Some families are WhatsApp, some families are text, some families don't communicate, but my family is an email family. If you get a phone call from my father, you know that something is extremely urgent and or very bad, okay? There isn't any sort of casual calling. There's no pick up the phone, hey, how are you? It doesn't happen really in my family. Um, so I called my parents, red flag number one. And so, and then my mother was listening to the tone of my voice, didn't sound urgent, didn't sound tragic. Okay, so the fact that I called her and wasn't in a panic, 98% she already knew what I was going to tell her. And then I said, is Tati home? And I asked for my father, and she said, he's out. And I said, when is he coming back? Could you call me back when he's home? Right at that point, my mother was at 99.999% sure um, right, of what I was going to tell her. And my parents did eventually call me back. The glee in their voice has made it clear that I actually did not have to say anything. They already knew. Um, and I'm telling you this story both because it's entertaining and I want you to be entertained, um, but also because that kind of reliance on context and that kind of reliance on people coming to the conclusions on their own um, is something that is actually going to be very strong, if not the strongest element in the sources and rabbinic literature that we're going to look at. There is this valorization of not stating the news explicitly, but allowing the context to speak and allowing the news receiver to 
kind of process that news on their own, come to the realization on their own, to the point where it's almost as if the bad news giver is extraneous, right? They don't actually even need to be there because they've set up all of the conditions for the person who is receiving the bad news to be able to process it and maybe even be able to generate, right, what that bad news is on their own. Um, okay, so what we are going to do for the, for the bulk of our conversation is we're going to be looking at the story of where, at least according to the Midrash, it is Moshe who tells Aaron that he is going to pass away. And that's going to be the bulk of what we're doing. That's pages one through three. But we're actually going to start, plot twist, we are going to start together on page four. So Bachi, I hope you're ready for that. Big switch. Okay, we're going to start on in the middle of page four, where it says Bava Metzia 59b, and we're going to look at three examples of rabbis or rabbinic figures, okay, by which I mean not rabbis, but people who behave like rabbis, um, who are going to exemplify this trend of, I'm going to actually give you some clues, and then you're going to figure it out on your own. So the first example that I wanted to give you is the example from the um, well-known story of the oven of Achnai, Tanuro Shel Achnai, um, which is a very, very, very long and very rich and very interesting story, which ends with an excommunication of Rabbi Eliezer. And there's a real preoccupation on the part of the story um, for both the who and the how of how that news is going to be delivered to Rabbi Eliezer. Okay, so that's where we're picking up. We're picking up at the, towards the end of a very lengthy story, but I had compassion. We're just going to start at the end. Bava Metzia 59. Okay, they said, right, the rabbis that are part of this whole, um, you know, very unpleasant scene said, on that day, sorry, these are the narrator speaking. On that day, they brought all the pure things that Rabbi Eliezer had declared impure. Sorry. Yeah, sorry, that Rabbi Lezer had, had declared pure, and they burnt them with fire. They voted regarding him, and they excommunicated him. Right, so essentially, all the things that Rabbi Lezer said were okay. They came and said, this stuff is garbage, we're going to burn it all, and we're going to excommunicate Rabbi Eliezer. They did all of this conveniently when Rabbi Eliezer was not there. Okay, so they've excommunicated him, but he doesn't know. So then they said... Who will go and notify him? Excommunication doesn't work if the excommunicated and all of the community don't know about it. Right? It's, it's a social ostracization. Rabbi Akiva said, I will go, lest an improper person inform him. And he will destroy the whole earth. For people familiar with the story, this isn't really such an exaggeration um, in terms of what we're concerned the Rabbi Lezer might do because we know he has somewhat magical powers um, and he's a very strong and very influential person, both in the realm of the natural and in the realm of the supernatural. Um, and so Rabbi Akiva said, I need to be the one to do this, right? He steps up to be the one to do this because he's concerned that the wrong person coming and further insulting Rabbi Eliezer is going to be catastrophic. What did Rabbi Akiva do? We're continuing in the story. He dressed in black and sat before him, sat before Rabbi Eliezer at a distance of four amot. Four amot is approximately six feet, which you might recognize as the social distance distance. Okay, I think in our context, um, it may be a coincidence, it may not be, right? But, the, but in general, right, in rabbinic literature, four amot, six feet, is essentially a person's personal space, okay? If I'm sitting at a distance of four amot or more, I'm essentially saying, I can't be next to you. I can't be with you. And Rabbi Eliezer said, Akiva, what is different today from all days? Why are you being so standoffish? Why are you sitting so far away from me? And Rabbi Akiva answers, my master, it seems to me that your friends distance themselves from you. He too tore his clothes, removed his shoes, sat on the ground, and his eyes flowed tears. Okay, it's actually a little bit unclear here who is doing all of these actions. It seems like they're both right, doing these actions. This is a story on the more explicit side of the spectrum. But even in this story, right, Rabbi Akiva 
is not telling Rabbi Eliezer at first what is happening to him. He's in first sort of engaging with him at this distance, which raises Rabbi Eliezer's antennae. And then Rabbi Eliezer says, Rabbi Akiva, tell me. Right? Tell me what's up. And then Rabbi Akiva says, well, actually, it seems to me that maybe you are not in the same position of power you once were. Okay, that's one example. Um, the second example is a little bit more painful um, because we're dealing not with just excommunication but with the loss um, and the loss of children, which is you know, particularly painful. Um, but here's the story. The story is about Rabbi Meir. And if you look at the Hebrew, you'll see that the title of this is Eshet Chayel Mi Imsa, a woman of valor who will find. Okay, this is going to be a story you know already from the introduction. This is a story where we approve of what the woman is doing in the story. She's the exemplar of an Eshet Chayel, like me. Okay, a story about Rabbi Meir who was sitting and teaching in the Beit Midrash on Shabbat afternoon, and both of his sons died. What did his mother do? meaning not the mother of Rabbi uh, Meir, but the mother in Rabbi Meir's life, which is his wife, okay, the mother of his children. She placed them both on the bed and placed a sheet over them. After, we're on the next page, page five, after Shabbat, Rabbi Meir returned from the house of study to his own home. He said to her, right, to his spouse, where are my two sons? Right, already, he's used to being greeted right, by children when he comes home, like many a parent that comes home from work, and they're not there. And so he says, what's up? And she said to him, they went to the Beit Midrash. They actually went to meet you. He said to her, but I waited at the Beit Midrash, and I didn't see them. She doesn't respond. She hands him the cup for Havdalah, and he makes Havdalah. Again, he said, where are my two sons? She said, they went somewhere else and are coming now. She lied, okay? Um, she brought food for him. He ate and blessed after the meal. After he blessed after the meal, she said to him, Rabbi, Rebbe, I have a question to ask you. He said to her, say your question. She said to him, Rebbe, before today, a man came and deposited something in my keeping. Right? I've been entrusted with something that belongs to someone else. And now he has come back to take it. Shall we return it to him or not? He said to her, my daughter, right, which again, he doesn't mean literally, it's a term of endearment. If a person has a deposit, he has to return it to its owner. She said to him, were it not for your opinion, I would not have given it to him. Okay, so she's already sort of asking him to take responsibility for what's about to happen. What did she do? She took his hand and brought him up to that room. She brought him to the bed and took the sheet from upon them, right, from upon her two dead sons. He saw both of them dead and placed on the bed. He began to cry and say, my sons, my sons, my teachers, my teachers, my children by nature and my teachers who illuminated my face with their Torah. At that point, she said to Rebbe Meir, Rebbe, right? She's sort of forcing him to call upon his rabbinic learning and his you know, knowledge of what's right. She says to him, Rebbe, isn't this what you told me? That I need to return the deposit to its owner? He said, Adonai Natan v'adonai lakach yihishem Adonai mevarach. Hashem gave and Hashem took. May Hashem's name be blessed, which is what Eov says, right, when he is justifying the harsh decree. Rabbi Hanina said, in this way she comforted him, and his mind was put to rest. Okay, this is going to be an important factor. His mind is put to rest. Therefore, it says, I'm not sure that if I had to list right, uh, the qualities of the most amazing woman, this would be the story that I chose. Right? But I think that part of what's going on here with the language of Chayil is that these children are not Rebbe Meir's children. They are the children that belong to not really belong to, right, because the children belong to God, but who are the biological children of Rabbi Meir and his wife. And Rabbi Meir's wife, who is not named in this story, 
she sort of gets total control over her emotions, right? She does not make this at all about her, and she focuses on the task at hand, which is delivering the news to her husband in a way that makes him feel strong, in a way that is gradual, right, which is huge in these stories. We're going to see all of them are going to be gradual. Um, and in a way where he feels ready, at least according to the story, um, to understand and process that news. And this language of, of Nityashvan Ato, his mind was put at rest, is important because the opposite is really what we're trying to prevent, and that's what we're going to see in the next story. What we're trying to prevent is the concern that if somebody finds out too quickly, they're not ready to hear this news, they will go out of their mind. Okay, and I don't want to, I didn't uh, bring the example here of the counterexample because they're really not talking about the counterexample, really talking about this ideal of doing it gradually, but the counterexample um, is the Midrashic notion that when Sarah found out about the Akedah, even though she sort of knew um, that the Akedah was unsuccessful in the sense that her son was still alive, just hearing the news made her pass away. Okay, and so it really is clear um, that what these Midrashim are trying to get us to do is avoid that situation where the person is in so much shock that they're not able to process the emotions. Um, and the way that, I, that I've been thinking about this is that in some ways, it's kind of like a pre-grief, right? Where what, the way I understand grief is that something terrible happens, and then over a longer period of time, you start to come to terms with the fact that that's the reality, and it's no longer something that is destabilizing in your life, right? It's still maybe extremely difficult. It still um, may be really, um, you know, critical, right? It, it still may be constitutive of who you are, but it is integrated with who you are, and it just becomes part of your new reality. And so what it seems like these stories are really trying to do is they're trying to get ahead of that process. You kind of, you that is the person who's receiving the bad news, assimilate the reality or the possibility of this reality in a more abstract way, and then you finally realize, hey, this applies to you. Um, and in that way, you're kind of already assimilating the reality before you find out what that reality is. Um, the next passage that we're going to look at um, is a passage from Breshit Rabbah, where we're comparing two moments where God tells Avraham to do something really difficult and does not rip off the Band-Aid really quickly. Instead, gives him like dribs and drabs of information. So instead of just saying to Avraham, get up, we're going to the land of Canaan, God says, go out from your land, from your birthplace, from the house of your father, to the land that I will show you. Okay, right, and it seems pretty clear that it's getting harder and harder. It's not as hard to leave your land as it is to leave your birthplace, as it is to leave the house of your father, right? God is sort of bringing it into stages, right, so that Abraham is like fully appreciating what's going on and then doesn't tell him where he's going. And the question of the Midrash is, we're in the fifth line um, in the English and the fourth line in the Hebrew, Velama Logi Lalo, and why didn't God reveal it to Abraham? In order to make it dear to him and to give him reward for each and every step. Okay, so in the context of not giving Abraham all the specifics, there's the sense that it's like, it's good for Avraham to be trusting, and God is going to reward Avraham for his trust. Okay, but then we're going to see this dynamic repeat itself again. As the Midrash continues, this is Rabbi Yochanan's opinion in general. Rabbi Yochanan is actually very consistent, and he has the same approach to a much more difficult task that Avraham is being asked to complete, the Akedah, taking his son. Rabbi Yochanan said, he, that is God, said, Kachna et bincha et yechidcha. Please take your son, your only son. And Avraham said, well, this one is his mother's only child, and that one is his mother's only child. God said to him, Asher hafta, that you love. And Avraham said, what are you talking about? I love everybody. Are there limits to love? He said, 
Yitzchak. Right, Avram, we all know who we're talking about here. We're talking about your younger son. We're talking about Yitzchak. And why didn't God reveal it to him? In order to make it dear in his eyes and to give him reward for each utterance. Okay? Um, and right, and so it seems here, right, in the telling of Yakita, right, there is again this sense of, I'm going to tell you gradually, you are going to assimilate that information, and it's going to make it dear in your eyes, right? You're going to actually have a positive uh, relationship with it as opposed to a scared relationship with it. And there are other uh, versions of the story where they actually make it quite clear that the concern is Shema Titarif Da'ato, maybe Avraham is going to go crazy, maybe Avraham will not be able to um, process it, but I thought I would do this version because it's not quite as um, not quite as explicit about the risk. Okay, but so far what we have seen are three stories, three examples, and I'm sure if there are four examples, because I'm including the other longer story that we're going to do together of this phenomenon, it's broader, right? It's not just these four examples. Um, it takes, you know, only three points to prove a line. We have a certain tendency, right, on the part of the rabbis to valorize a way of giving information that is gradual and also that is recipient focused. You know, probably the most striking example of it being recipient focused is the way that Rabbi Mayer's wife totally shuts down her own emotions and focuses on the task at hand of telling her husband, even though she's experiencing the same kind of pain. Um, and we're going to see in the story of Moshe and Aaron that Moshe and Aaron. Um, they're actually not as successful, particularly Moshe is not as successful in sort of bracketing his own feelings in the process of telling his brother. And where do we can see, you know, really how hard it is. Now, as I said at the beginning, I'm not putting forth these stories in order to say this is the ideal, everybody needs to, you know, tell everybody bad news gradually, or in a way where they're kind of almost tricked, right, into accepting the news before the news comes. But rather, right, to allow us to understand that there are certain cultural conventions around conveying bad news, we have our own cultural conventions, which we should be at the very least sensitive to, even if we're not yet at the stage of really critically assessing them and maybe deciding that in certain contexts we want to abandon them. Okay, I'm going to pause here for a moment for folks to just absorb and for myself to take a drink of water. And then we're going to go back to page one and we're going to look at the main source um, that we've come here to uncover and really unpack. And I want to acknowledge that I first learned this source with um, Rabbi Tali Adler, who is probably the best teacher of Midrash that I know. And since then, I've probably taught it like a billion times more than her. Um, I, really, I really took a, a real liking to it. Um, and, and I will say that a lot of what I'm going to share with you in this lecture format are really insights that I got from other people when I was teaching this text in other contexts, um, because really this is a human question, right? It's not really a textual question. Um, and really understanding what we can learn practically from this text is labor that happens outside of the text, right, in the really bridging of the text and our own experience. We're going to start with the verses. We're on page one. Back to the beginning. We're in Bamidbar, and we are about to go to Hor Hahar, Mount Hor. Hor Hahar is notable for being the place where Aharon dies. And that is going to be our story. They set out from Kadesh, and the Israelites, B'nai Israel, the whole congregation came to Hor Hahar. They came to Mount Hor. Then God said to Moshe and Aaron at Mount Hor, on the border of the land of Edom, let Aaron be gathered to his people. For he shall not enter the land that I have given to the Israelites, because you, presumably both of you, rebelled against my command at May Merivah, at the waters of Merivah. Take Aaron and his son Eleazar and bring them up Mount Hor. Strip Aaron of his vestments 
and put them on his son Eleazar. But Aaron shall be gathered to his people and shall die there. Three are going up, two are coming down. Moshe did as the Lord had commanded. They went up Mount Hor in the sight of the whole congregation. Moshe stripped Aaron of his vestments, right, of his special priestly clothing, and put them on his son Eleazar. Right? There's this nice investiture moment where Aaron is giving his kuhuna, his high priesthood, to his son Eleazar. And Aaron died there on the top of the mountain. Moshe and Eleazar came down from the mountain. When all of the congregation saw that Aaron had died, all the house of Israel mourned for Aaron for 30 days. There are a number of things that are striking about this passage. I want to highlight a few of them that are really necessary for us to understand why the Midrash felt the need to write itself um, and where the, where the verses are kind of leading us. So the first thing that you'll notice is that first, if you look at Pasuk 23, if you look at Pasuk Chav Gimel, Vayom Rasham Amosha Ve'el Aharon. God is speaking to Moshe and Aharon. And then God continues to speak entirely in the third person about Aharon. To Moshe, to Moshe and Aharon, but there seems to be like a real shift here from what maybe is God's initial plan of I'm going to talk to Aharon and Moshe together to, I'm going to just have a sidebar with Moshe, where I'm going to talk to Moshe about Aharon. Okay, in the first pasuk, it seems like it could be more like he's talking to both of them, but talking about Aharon. But the further you get along in the passage, the more it seems like, yeah, I don't really see that God is talking to Aharon anymore so much as God is talking about Aharon. Okay, so the first question that the Midrash is going to want to address is, what happened? Right? Who is God speaking to, and why is there this shift? Um, the second element that uh, I think is really important is this element of going up in the sight of the whole congregation and then coming down in the sight of the whole congregation and there clearly being a gap between what at least Moshe knows is happening on the mountain and what the people no, is happening on the mountain. Because it's only when Moshe and Eleazar come back without Aaron do the people know from inference that Aaron has died, and then they mourn him. Okay, this should give us a little bit of sympathy for the, um, for the people of Israel, our forebears, in the sin of the golden calf, right? Where they saw Moshe, went up the mountain, he said he's gonna be back, and then he's not back. Okay, now we see, right, that there's some cultural context, right, that this is something that maybe people do. When they know it's their time, they go up the mountain, and then you don't see them again. Also, Moshe didn't pack any sandwiches. Moshe didn't pack any granola bars, right? So they actually had like a very reasonable um, assumption that maybe Moshe wasn't going to make it. But anyway, this isn't about Moshe yet. This is really about Aharon. Okay, so the two things that I want you to be sensitive to is that kind of shift from God speaking to Moshe and Aharon to God speaking about Aharon. Maybe he's aware, maybe he's not aware. And that element of B'nai Yisrael inferring the information as opposed to being told the information explicitly. Okay, I hope we're all ready to dive into the Midrash. We're moving on to page two. Um, this is a midrash from the Yalkut Shimoni. Yalkut means collection. Okay, and so there's a lot of midrashic material in the Yalkut Shimoni that is found in other places. And then there's a lot of material which is only found, or at least we're only aware of it, from the Yalkut Shimoni itself. And a lot of that material that's sort of new and unique to the Yalkut Shimoni is often later um, and also often more... Uh, discursive, right? It's longer. It, it, it unpacks things a little bit more. So you're going to see that this is a very long midrash, um, but it's really very beautiful and really very compelling, and I'm sure that you will all be riveted from the beginning to the end. There's actually two, um, two approaches that the Yalkut Shimoni has taken to these verses. The first approach is what's in the first box on page two, which is about Moshe being a little bit jealous 
of the way that Aharon gets to so clearly pass on his mantle to his son and talking about like what a beautiful death Aharon has, that's a very nice thing. We're not talking about that. I gave it to you because it's really beautiful and I thought, why not? Okay, but we're actually going to start with um, the second box. Amar Leha Kadash Baruch Moshe, the Holy Blessed One said to Moshe. Okay, so we're at the bottom of page two. The Holy Blessed One said to Moshe, Ase Tova, do me a solid, okay? Do me a favor, do something good for me, and tell Aharon about the death, because I am ashamed to say it to him. Okay, even if we just had this line, Dayenu, right? Such a beautiful and, you know, touching explanation of what happened. God had initially planned to tell Aaron himself. That's why God said, Moshe and Aaron, come here, I got something to tell you. And then when God actually had to look into Aaron's eyes and tell him that he was going to die, I mean, I hate to use this language, clape mala, to say this about God, but it seems like God wussed out, right? God said, I'm ashamed to say it to him. You know, and when we think of, you know, all of the various reasons why somebody might be hesitant um, to share bad news, I think there often is this sense of the concern around blaming the messenger, right, which usually is unfounded. But in this case, it's actually quite reasonable because who is the one who decides um, that people die, when people die, right? So Hashem actually has very good reason to say, I don't want to take responsibility for this. I don't want to be the one to tell Aharon. Okay, and so to me, like, this is, this is a Dayenu moment because it's so validated, right? Telling people bad news is so hard as to be superhuman, and it's so superhumanly difficult that God, God's self is like, you know what? I think that I'm going to pass the baton to you, human being, because I don't actually feel equipped to do it myself. Okay, but someone has to do it, Uh, and it's going to be Moshe. And unfortunately, usually, we are Moshe. Okay, we are the ones that are going to have to step up, right, and say the things that are difficult to say. Rav Huna said in the name of Rabbi Tanhum Barchia, what did Moshe do? He woke up early in the morning, and he went to Aaron. He started to call, Aaron, my brother, Aaron came down to him and he said, why did you come here so early today? Right, there's always that moment of the antennae. Right, and so Aaron's very uh, sensitive. He's like, Moshe, it's 5 a.m. Right, what are you doing here? And Moshe said, I was thinking about a Torah matter at night and it was very difficult for me and that is why I came so early to you. Right, you could almost see it's a page out of Rabbi Meir's wife's playbook. Right, where Moshe is, um, is giving Aaron the power, saying, I actually need you. You are going to be helping me. And then Aaron, good older brother, says, what is the matter? I also just you know, want to point out that generally you would think that if somebody had a Torah problem, Right, the person they will go to is Moshe. Right? And so there's this kind of sweetness, this really sweet humility where Moshe himself, when Moshe has a problem with the Torah, is seeking out guidance from other people. Okay, so he says, I was thinking about this Torah matter and it was very difficult and I need your help. And Aaron says, sure, what is the matter? And then Moshe says something very strange. We are uh, five lines from the bottom in the English. Four lines from the bottom in the Hebrew. Amarle eni yodeya mahayaha davar. I don't know what it was. Okay, I was so distraught. I was turning this over in my mind over and over. I had to come to you first thing in the morning, but I have no idea actually what I'm talking about. Okay, so you can almost see like Moshe maybe starting to back down, right? I came all this way. I have to tell you something really important. What is it? Nothing. I don't remember what it was, okay? But eventually, Moshe pushes through, and he says, but I know that it was in Sefer Breshit. Bring it, and we'll read it, okay? In a slight anachronism, (laughs) Aaron has a copy of Sefer Breshit in his house. They took Sefer Breshit and read it. It was a very beautiful chavruta of brothers. 
At each and every section, he said, that is, Aaron said, the Holy Blessed One made well and created well. Okay, so Aaron is this very sweet validation of every moment of creation. When they, okay, we're on page three now, got to the creation of humanity, Moshe said, what should I say? Right, to, but really about humanity, who brought death into the world. Okay, so there's this, you know, very nice affirmation. They're saying, ah, oh, it's so beautiful, fish, trees, so amazing. And then we're starting to get to day six. And uh, Moshe's like, oh, I don't know if we want to read this part about human beings. We're the worst. We brought death into the world. And then Aaron said, Moshe, my brother, don't speak of this matter, right? Don't be so negative. Don't we accept the decree of God? How were Adam and Chava created? How did they merit 13 chupo, which is another midrashic trope we don't have time to go into. As it says, you were to eat in the garden of God, da 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 da. How could he have eaten from the tree and have it said to him, for you are dust? Moshe said to him, after all of this greatness, this is what came to him? Okay, so Aaron is saying, well, human beings are actually not that bad. Okay, yes, we brought death into the world, but there was a lot of good things that happened before. And then Moshe's like, yeah, but those good things highlight how tragic it is, right, that now uh, people are mortal. Okay, so if we're not going to blame them for bringing death into the world, since that's not an approach that Aharon is jumping on, Moshe then seizes on the sadness train and says, well, isn't it so horrible? Isn't it so devastating? The people who are so wonderful, right, are now subject to mortality. And Aharon said to him, and I, who ruled over Malachi Hashare, who ruled over the ministering angels, and you who stopped death, is in our end to this? Aaron says, yeah, but everybody dies, even us. Okay, and here, I, 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 with all humility, I think there's like a little bit of a typo here, right? Because the person who ruled over Malachi Hashare is Moshe, right? When he went up to heaven and he got the Torah, there are a lot of Midrashic material that has him arguing with the angels, stealing it from the angels, right? So there's this sense that Moshe overpowers angels. And then the notion of stopping death probably comes from the image of Aaron bringing his incense to stop the plague, okay? So it probably should be reversed, right? Where Aaron says, I who stopped death and you who ruled over the angels, but that's just a side note isn't our end to this, right? We're amazing. We're our own and Moshe. But you know what? We're still mortal. Um, how much longer do we have to live? He asks rhetorically. Another 20? <laughs> Moshe said to him, nah, we're not talking about a full 20. Okay, so there's this sort of real, it's a, it's a very dramatic shift, right? Where our road and Moshe are talking about death in the abstract. And Aaron is talking about death in such an accepting way. And he already is applying the category of mortality to himself, but it's an eventuality for him. I'll die when I'm old, right? So I can talk about death in a, in a comfortable way because I don't think of myself as in the process of it. So he says, hello, we got another 20 in Terrebang? And Moshe's like, say 20. Okay, so he says fewer. And he went down and down until he mentioned the day of the death. Right, so you can hear a kind of Avraham style, but maybe I have 15. And Moshe's like, I wouldn't say 15. And Aaron's like, well, what about a solid decade? And Moshe's like, well, a decade seems like a lot of time. And then eventually, right, they get to the point where Aaron is like, what about till tonight? And Moshe's like, I don't want to make any commitments. Okay, right? He gets all the way down to that day. And then Aaron doesn't have any more fight left. Immediately, Aaron's bones felt his impending death. Right? And there's this like very beautiful description of how he senses it in his body before he fully processes it in his mind. And he said to him, oh, like perhaps the matter that was troubling you all night is really not about the text. It's not about you. It's for me. And Moshe said to him, yes. And immediately Israel saw 
that his stature was diminished, as it says, by Yeru Kol Ha'eda, right? This image of the people being able to actually see Aaron crumple, right? When he realizes um, this terrible thing that's going to happen to him, right? That he's dying at least 20 years um, before he thought that he would. And this moment also sort of highlights the way in which Aaron thinks it's a story about Aaron. But the people, right, they have a relationship with Aaron. And this is actually not just a story about Moshe and Aaron or Aaron himself or God and Moshe, but it's really a story that's much broader than the people who think that it's about them. Aaron said, we're in the middle of page three, my heart is vacant in my chest and the death terrors have fallen on me. And Moshe said to him, do you accept death? And Aaron said, yes. And then Moshe said, let's go. We're going up to Hor Hahar. Um, I just want to sort of pause here in this image of Aaron describing himself as having halal bikirbi, right? He is, it's like his heart fell out. And he's experiencing the pain and the fear of death, right? Be'emot mavet naflu alai. I want to pause here because I think it's an extremely important moment where this is ostensibly a story of Moshe delivering the news to Aharon in the ideal rabbinic way. They do it through Torah. Aharon comes to the realization himself, you know, and still, it doesn't actually make the news okay. Aharon doesn't smile. Aaron has this very serious emotional reaction. Um, and the text doesn't try to sort of paint over that, right? The text is actually very clear. It sort of shows us Aaron saying, I feel at a loss. I feel petrified. I feel empty. Um, and it's hard, right, to see Aaron's emotional reaction. But it's important for us to see our own emotional reaction. And I think that that's also a signal to us, right? When we are um, delivering bad news first, um, not to expect that if we do it in the perfect way, it's going to somehow make the news less bad. Um, And second, that part of the process is actually being there to witness, right? That person's emotional reaction and to hold them in that emotional reaction instead of like delivering your piece and then running away right before the waterworks or before the anger or before anything else right, that you might not want to witness, part of your role as the person who is giving the news is you also have to be there to hold the entire process of the receiving of the news, which includes being this witness to um, the difficult experience that the receiver of the news um, is going to go through. Okay, we're at to then all three of them. It's about um, a third up from the bottom. Um, <coughs> um, okay, they all went up. Moshe, Aaron, and Elazar before the eyes of all of Israel. Everybody sees them leave. Okay, everybody knows exactly where they went, and everybody's expecting them to come back down. If they had known that he was going up to die, Israel would not have let him, and they would have prayed for mercy. But they thought that maybe the divine word had beckoned him. Okay, so they see this, and B'nai Israel is oblivious. If B'nai Israel knew, had an inkling of the possibility that Aaron was going to his death, they would have handcuffed him. Right? They would have shackled him to the ground. They would not have let him go. Okay, and so here, right, you could see the Midrash is saying sometimes it's actually important to conceal the information, right, at least at certain critical moments, because maybe for Ahara, right, it was important for him to know that he was going to pass away before he passed away. But maybe for B'nai Israel, right, it was exactly the opposite. They could not have known before. And I also think there's this really nice um, distinction, which I think we see a lot, where the people who are actually experiencing the tragedy 
can often have like a maturity and equanimity about their situation that other people who are sort of side impacted by it don't have. Okay, so we see that um, Aaron has this perspective. He's, he's willing, he accepts it upon himself. But we know that B'nai Israel do not have the maturity to do that. Um, and I think there is a way in which B'nai Israel sort of, in some ways, right, represent children, where um, you, know, you don't tell children always at every moment exactly what's going to happen. You have to tell them at the stage and the age that's appropriate for them. Okay. Um, when they went up, a cave was opened for them, and they saw a heavenly bed. Now, the cave is an image both of you know, privacy, right? Aaron and Eleazar and Moshe are going to go into this room, um, but it's also a, a site for burial. Um, okay. And they saw a heavenly bed. And Aaron would take off one garment, and Eleazar would wear it. And he, that is Aaron, will be wrapped by a cloud. With this extremely beautiful image of Aaron stripping his garments, but it's being done in this way of like total dignity, right? Where it doesn't leave Aaron naked, it leaves Aaron enveloped by a cloud, where he's sort of moving from the physical to the ethereal. Moshe said, Aaron, my brother, what do you see? And then we have this amazing turn where Moshe makes this whole scene about him. We've all done this, and this is a cautionary tale where Moshe really is called to support Aharon in this moment, but Moshe is like overwhelmed by the beauty of this process of the investiture of Elazar's of Elazar, um, Aharon's son, which if you read the first box of the Midrash, which we skipped, you would know was a huge preoccupation for Moshe. And all of a sudden Moshe's like, wait, this is actually a great way to die. And I'm worried that I'm not going to have it. Ira, my brother, what do you see? Miriam died and you and I took care of her. You are dying. And you see me and Elazar taking care of you. But if I die, who will take care of me? And then the Holy Blessed One said, by your life, Moshe, I will take care of you. As it says, that it's actually God who is the one who buries Moshe. Okay, but you sort of see the way in which it's so difficult, right? Even for Moshe, who's trying to be there for his brother, right? To, to maintain that focus on his brother, he starts to bring it back to his own pain. Right, he starts to bring it to his own security, his own insecurity, and God kind of needs to step in and say, Moshe, don't worry, I got you. This is not about you right now. Okay. Um, the Holy Blessed One said, go out of here. When they left, the cave closed up, and Moshe and Elazar came down. Okay? Three men went up, two men came down. And all of Israel, we're on the next page now, are looking, page four, at the fact that three went up, but only two came down. And they split into three factions. Okay, B'nai Israel, right, are here. They're the exemplars of people that don't have the information that they need. Aaron is the exemplar of someone who gets the information that he needs in the best way we see that Aaron feels afraid of his death before it happens. But the process of it happening is actually quite serene. It's so serene and he feels so supported that it makes Moshe jealous. Okay, but now we're gonna sort of flip the camera and we're gonna look at B'nai Israel, who are people who maybe also, right, needed some of that information and are suffering from the lack of it. So all of B'nai Israel are looking at the fact that three went up, but only two came down, and they split into three factions. One said, Moshe killed him out of jealousy. This is something that's not unusual for B'nai Israel to do, always throwing Moshe under the bus. But they said, listen, you know, we don't have that many suspects, okay? Three people went up, two people went down. Okay, so we have one, one scenario is Moshe killed Aaron out of jealousy. 
And then another faction said, no, Eleazar killed him because he wanted to inherit the high priesthood. And one said, he died by way of heaven. Okay, so we have these three different factions. People just don't know what to believe. Some people believe the truth, but they're not actually basing that on anything. They don't know, right? They don't know it any more than the people who blame Moshe or the people who blame Eleazar. And so again, we have God stepping in and he gestures to the malachim, he gestures to the angels. And they opened the cave and they brought out Aharon's coffin. This is, right, I think a moment where the Midrash is saying sometimes people need concrete information, sometimes they need closure, right? And, and, and um, the finality of what happened, B'nai Israel need access to that, right? Because in all of our valorization of inferring, right, where people sort of can figure out what's happening, right? We see here the weakness of that, where B'nai Israel don't have enough information, their inferences are all over the place, and they're not at peace. And so we actually say, maybe inferring, inferring is not always the right strategy. Um, sometimes we're going to need to be more explicit. And God says, okay, right, we're going to treat B'nai Israel like adults, and I'm going to show them. Right, something that's extremely difficult for them to see, but it's going to have a positive effect. They are going to understand. They are going to have closure. And it was flying in the sky. Okay, Aaron's coffin is flying in the sky, and the angels are praising and flying before it. I'm not sure this is going to happen for all of us, but it appears to have happened for Aaron. And all of Israel saw, as it says, kol ha'ida ki gava Aaron. The community saw that Aaron passed. Okay, right, and the seeing here, in the Pasuk is, this is when they're figuring it out. And in the Midrash, the Midrash chooses to make the seeing much more literal, right? And I think that that's a deliberate choice to say, sometimes you actually need to be explicit in order for people to fully understand and fully come to terms with what's happening. Um, and what were they praising? Meaning all of these angels that are singing around Aharon's um, coffin. Yavo shalom, yanuchu al mishkivotam. He will come in peace. They will rest on their beds, right? And and this closing image, um, I find to be very touching because it kind of pushes the notion that this is such bad news, right? That there is a sense in which nobody's going to live forever. Aaron is going to need to pass away, and there's going to be something good. Right, that comes out of it. The, he, is, he is at peace. There's this, um, there's this nice ending where everything feels um, tied up at the end. Um, what I want to do now is just draw out what I think some of the lessons are, or at least some of the um, highlights are, um, of this Midrash. Um, and then we'll have some opportunity for folks to share um, anything that they've gleaned from these stories or ask any questions that they might have. Okay. Um, so the first moment um, in the story that, that we saw um, that I found to be particularly striking um, is this moment where Hashem says, I don't want to be the one to do this, <laughs> right? I'm embarrassed to be the person, well, the entity um, that is going to deliver this bad news. And I think it's just extremely important for us to feel that validation on the part of the Midrash that this is something that's really difficult and it's something that's really scary and it's something that we don't want to do. And God didn't want to do it and God was able to pass the buck to Moshe. We're not always able to pass the buck, but it does open the possibility right, for us to pass the buck, meaning the second thing that I think we're really learning from this Midrash is how important the messenger is. God didn't say, I can't do it, and therefore nobody should do it. God also didn't say, this feels hard for me, I'm going to need to push through it anyway. God found the right person to deliver this message. Moshe and Aaron go way back. Right? They have certain understandings. Um, and I think that often when we're in the situation where we need to um, deliver the bad news, we feel like, A, it has to be us, 
right, which may not actually be the case. Um, or the opposite, right, we might try to palm it off on someone else when it really needs to be us, right? And so much of the ability in these stories for people to uh, glean from context what's happening is actually grounded in the relationship that they have with the people that are giving them the information. Rebbe um, Eliezer calls Rebbe Akiva Akiva, right? They're friends. He Rabbi Akiva volunteers for this role of telling the bad news because he knows that it matters um, who the person is who is going to be sharing the news. Okay, so the first two things that we're learning is one, we're appreciating and we're validating that it could be really hard and that's okay to acknowledge that. Um, and the second is that the messenger really matters and in some ways the messenger can be often almost the whole conveying of the message. Um, the second thing that I want to notice is that there's a way in which Aaron, as the recipient of the news, is way more equipped to deal with the news than Moshe or God. Right? Moshe and God are very anxious about delivering the news. They're trying to be very delicate. They're tiptoeing around the issue. Moshe has this moment where Aaron says, what was the matter? And Moshe says, I forgot. Okay? Right? Which I don't think is the case. Right? Moshe had a plan, and then when the going got tough, Moshe like backed down a little bit. Um, and I think there is uh, an anxiety that we have about the fragility of the recipient um, that sometimes we don't need to have. Right? And it's really just a projection of our own insecurity and our own fear. Um, but people are stronger right, than we give them credit for. So that's the third thing. Uh, the fourth is this moment um, at the end of the story where God brings out the coffin. God makes sure that B'nai Israel can see the body, right? And this is something that we are often, you know, really resistant to, being non-euphemistic, right? Being very concrete. God didn't thunder out a voice and say, you may never see our own again, I can either confirm or deny, right? God actually comes out and he says, I understand that in order for you to really accept what happened, you're going to need to see, and I'm going to enable you to see, right? And again, there's that trust. Um, and the fifth element of this story is just that everything is very gradual. It's a long story. It's a slow story. At least according to rabbinic tradition, you can't just come in and drop a bomb and then leave. You need to be strategic. You need to think it through. Um, and in some sense, I wonder if it doesn't really even matter what the actual approach is that you end up taking, so long as the person who is hearing from you and talking to you can sense that you're being deliberate, right? Where they know that, that you care right, about how hard this is for them, and you've decided on how you're going to approach it, even if the approach isn't necessarily going to be the one that's perfect for them, there is, um, there's a real significance to putting the effort into how you're going to approach it. Um, and the last piece that I want us to see from this story is that it's possible that this is a story where Moshe does everything right. I don't know, okay, but let's say that this is a story where this is the ideal and Moshe does everything right. Still, we have that moment in the story where Aaron says, I feel vacant inside, right? It's what we would call like our stomach dropping, and I'm petrified, okay? There, and, and you know, this brings us back a little bit to what we were talking about last week, right? Where we have to think about the limitations of the person who is in the conversational mode. You're not actually changing the reality. The emotional experience that the person is going to have, they are going to have. All you can do is not make it worse. Okay, so Moshe, he could be a success here. But Aaron is still upset. And that's okay. It doesn't mean that Moshe was not a success here. Um, and before I turn it over to you, I just want to note um, some of the ways in which our ways of delivering bad news are really absent from this story and the other stories that we saw. The first element that we do a lot, and I feel that Aaron and Moshe do not do, is there's no sandwiching. Moshe doesn't say, I have good news for you, and I have bad news for you. 
The good news is that Elazar, your son, is going to be the Kohen Gadol. The bad news is it's because you're going to die. But the good news is that in the process, you're going to be covered in a cloud. There's no softening by sandwiching. Moshe has something that he needs to say. Moshe says that thing. And then they go and that thing happens. Right? There isn't this sense of, oh, well, if I bracket it with things that are positive, that is somehow going to make it um, less of a difficult thing that I have to convey. And the second piece, which you know, is a real cultural component um, that we have, and I, I don't see it in this story, but I, I also couldn't imagine seeing it in this story, is that Moshe never says he's sorry. Right? Even God never says he's sorry. Right? But one of the sort of standard ways in which we try to soften, but more often uh, like soften our own complicit, our, our feeling of being complicit, is that we say, I'm so sorry to be the one to tell you. I'm so sorry that this is happening. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Right? And in this story, there is no I'm so sorry. There is just the news and sensitivity around the news. And the moment of the story where Moshe makes it about himself, right, and starts to talk about what about me, that's a story of Moshe's failure, right? And so in some sense, the I'm sorry-ness, right, is actually about you and how you're feeling about the whole situation. And that's not really helpful because either it's something out of your control and when you say that you're sorry, you are making it about you, or it's something that is in your control, okay? And then the I'm sorryness is just very sincere and very painful. If you are in a situation where you need to fire someone and you say, I'm so sorry, it's not great because maybe you don't have to fire them, right? The, and that's the element of God being embarrassed, right? God doesn't say, the way I'm going to deal with my embarrassment and my responsibility here it's by saying, I'm sorry first, because that's totally going to solve the problem, right? There's this sort of um, implicit understanding here. And again, I'm not sure how much it was even on the radar, right, for them to consider um, using the language of apology, but there's no apology here. And there also doesn't really seem to be a lot of softening of the reality of it. There is a gradualness and an attempt to often think about it maybe in theological terms, right, where someone can feel more willing. Um, but there's no maybes. There's no death isn't as bad as you think it is. There's a matter of factness once you get to the point um, <coughs> where the news is delivered. Rabbi Akiva doesn't say, yes, You've been excommunicated, but I've seen this a million times before. People come out of excommunication all of the time. No, right? there's the reality that is on the ground now, and there's no softening, and there's no attempt to kind of walk it back. Right? Once it's been delivered, it doesn't get walked back. Um, and the last piece that, um, that, I, that I found very striking in a lot of these stories, um, and particularly the, the Rebbe Mayer story, is there's no infantilizing of the person who is receiving the news. And in fact, there's this attempt to allow them to step into right, their own greatness and their own understanding and to shift the power dynamic from being the person with the news is more powerful and the person without the news is less powerful to I'm going to call you rabbi. I'm going to come to you with my problem. I'm going to allow you to teach me in the process of my um, explaining something to you. And I think, uh, you know, the, the, most of the examples here are about death or things related to death. We, I think, are probably um, in our minds imagining many more different scenarios. Um, but the one scenario that I'm, I'm thinking about where I feel like infantilizing is a huge risk is, you know, if you're a medical professional, right, and you need to tell someone, we got results back and the results don't look good. You know, there's a real temptation there um, to talk down to the patient, to not give them the information that they need, or to not betray your own, your own you know, doubts and, your, the, and the non-finality, right, of whatever, whatever verdict you're hanging down. There's some sense of, I can handle it, I'm the expert, and they can't handle it, right, they, because they don't have the information, because they don't have the expertise, they're sort of less adult. 
Uh, and one of the really powerful elements of these stories, at least for me, um, is the way in which there's a conscious decision not to do that. That we're going to remind the people who are receiving this difficult news that they do have power, they have knowledge, and they have the wherewithal to understand what's happening, even without being told explicitly, and to come to terms with it in their own way, right? without being um, talked down to, without being apologized to, um, and without any softening, without anybody telling them that it's not as bad as they think it is. It could be as bad as they think it is, but the lesson that you want to impart to them is that they're strong enough to make it through. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Morty to field some comments or questions. Hi, Dina. Thank you. Thank you for sharing these stories with us and for teaching us tonight. Um, we have a few questions that I'll just jump right into. One of them is particularly related to medical professionals, um, as, you, as you were just talking about, but it's in a little bit of a different direction. Um, a lot of these stories involve kind of elaborate setups and if you know and, and maybe it's not just medical professionals but anybody who has to give bad news but but they're not you know who you might want to be in terms of the relationship with that person I, I guess it's like kind of like when you don't have the time or even the knowledge or awareness of this person to know how to give it to them can you speak to that scenario a little bit and that dynamic yeah um so I so I think that what this question is pointing to is our inability to necessarily always have the time or space or knowledge of the person who we're speaking to to be able to set up an elaborate scenario. That's true. I'm not sure I can help you with that. But I think that this question also points us to recognizing that often those pieces are there even if we haven't actually deliberately put them there. Right? When the doctor uh, calls you, you already know that it's not good news. Doctors don't just spend their time calling their patients to chat, okay? Um, and, and, you know, an, another sort of social convention that we have, which I'm not so sure is good, but, you know, this, uh, are you sitting down? Right? When you say to someone, are you sitting down, you're already telling them, I think you might faint. If a doctor has tissues on the desk, right, very strategically placed right in front of you, right, you know that there is an expectation that you're going to have some emotional reaction. And so to the extent that we're not always able to put these systems in place, I think it might be helpful for us to recognize the ways in which these systems sometimes are in place. And sometimes they might be uh, destructive, right? In the sense that if you've decided that the best way to give this person the information is to tell them something explicitly face-to-face -face before they had the opportunity to Google every single possibility of what might be wrong with them on a WebMD, you might want to think about what are the signs that I'm sending them, right? That might send them Googling and try not to send those signs. Um, so I think that the questioner is right uh, to highlight that we're not always in a position to set up elaborate schemes, but I think we're always in a position to be sensitive to the ways in which there are certain conventions that are sending people signals and sending people information, and to just be on top of that and be responsive to it. But to the Thank question. You. Thank you. And uh, jumping off of that into a different universe, um, social media um, has created all kinds of new conventions around good news and bad news and, and everything in between. Um, and particularly, we actually have a we have a question or, or, or somebody asked, is there anything better? Is there ever a better is there any is there a better response to bad news to a particular type of bad news than Baruch Dayan I met? It can feel so inadequate. And so I'm kind of trying to put those questions together of like when we're living in a social media world, in a Twitter world where everything is however many characters you're allowed to use now. Um, I don't know, is, is, is it better to maybe step back and just say, you know, this is not the right venue for the avenue for this kind of thing? Or is there a, or is there a way to engage with bad news constructively and productively and healthily uh, on social media? 
Yeah, the social media question is uh, very relevant. Uh, I would say that I, I personally, I, I would say I'm medium active on social media. Um, and I think I, I find that social media is a great way to receive information, but it is not a great way to process and talk around those things. Um, and to use you know, a very simple, very low stakes example, which is not negative. Um, if you have a close friend and you find out that it's their birthday on Facebook, you could write happy birthday on their Facebook wall, or you could take the information that it's their birthday and call them, right? Where you sort of step out of the social media realm and its uh, deficiencies, right? And try to use it for what it's good for um, and not use it for what it's bad for. Um, just as a side note, right? The notion that I should say Baruch Dayan HaEmet when something bad happens to you, it's kind of a newfangled thing, right? A person is supposed to say, Baruch Dayan HaEmet, blessed is the true judge, I accept this terrible thing when it happens to them. And this is another, you know, this is an instantiation of where we confuse, right, somebody else's bad news and our emotional reaction with it being our, you know, emotional bad news. Um, and yeah, it's hard not to rely on a script and part of what we were talking about last week was that in the absence of a script, you know, you just want to show up um, and not sort of expect um, too much on the part of the person who is experiencing that bad situation. But uh, it's hard, right? It's hard to make that leap out of the social media world if that's how you're getting the information. Uh, but I think it's worth it. And it's not as hard as it seems. One takeaway from tonight, not as hard as it seems. Um, just kidding. Um, okay, we've gotten a lot of interesting comments, but I think that's it for the questions. So if there's one, if there's a, if there's something you want to close out on, feel free. Uh, yeah, the, I first of all want to say that for folks who have comments and don't have questions, you are still more than welcome to email me. I'm very very interested in your comments. Um, I, I think that one of the lessons that I learned in preparing this material is that no model really is going to be perfect. And what's important for us to do is to be aware of when we're following a script and when we're writing a script and what that script is for and who that script serves. Uh, because in many cases, we think that these processes are for the person who is the recipient. And really these processes are serving us and to the extent it's possible for us to separate right, our emotional responses and our emotional needs, which are real, right? If we love someone and they're going through something difficult, those emotional responses that we have and those emotional needs that we have are very, very real, um, but to be careful not to burden right, the person who is the recipient of that news with our emotional needs and make sure that they are not in a position where they are supporting us um, when really we are supposed to be supporting them. So thank you very much um, for joining us tonight and looking forward to having more difficult conversations next week. Thank you so much, Dina. Have a good night, everyone.